Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. I would like to extend a warm welcome not only to those that are here in the audience, but also to those watching online. You are part of uh, Laguna Niguel Church family as well. Thank you so much for coming out to listen to the Word of God this beautiful Sabbath morning. I would like to also extend a uh, word of comfort to the Rothburn family. It's a difficult time they are having in the valley of the shadow of death. But one thing is sure, that you are not alone, not even there. So uh, we pray that the good Lord will uh, give you comfort, peace, and the assurance of uh, salvation in these difficult moments. You know, one of the most difficult things when a pastor moves is books. Books. Books are heavy, and pastors have books. I know I have books. And yesterday they brought us our stuff from uh, the storage, and uh, my books are still in boxes. You know, other people have toolboxes, I have book boxes. My book boxes are my toolboxes. Yes, Michael, don't look at me like that. I know you have toolboxes. I have book boxes. I can't wait to get them out. There's a certain ritual that goes with it. I could dig my Bible up from one of the boxes, boxes but uh, it's not easy. Now, when people see my boxes and my books, they say, wow, Pastor Joe likes books. And some others say, wow, Pastor Joe loves reading. Well, I have to disappoint you, I don't. I mean, yeah, I, I love books, but reading is a pretty difficult process for me because when I read, my brain is like a winnowing machine. Anybody knows what a winnowing machine is? A winnowing is the process when you separate chaff from grains. And uh, I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, when I was a child, I was told I have to read extensively if I want to know, and I love knowing. I have to, live, to, to read extensively if I want to understand life, and I want to understand life. But here's the thing. When my brain goes in a winnowing machine mode, I read and read and read extensively, and I have... I, often have the feeling I have to winnow through a lot of chaff until I get to some grain. One of my principles when I read is I try to eliminate as much as possible books that are chaffy. So, uh, yeah, that's a good principle. If you like reading, that's wonderful, that's great. Please try to eliminate as much as possible books that are chaffy. Yeah, when I read, I read to get to the grains, to the seeds. I love finding seeds, grains. But it's been for a while now that uh, I read for a different reason too. I read because I'm not only looking for grains or seeds, I'm also looking for pots. Yes, pots. Because words can function like pots. Not long ago, we visited a family of flower gardeners, people that grow flowers and sell flowers. Very interesting uh, way of looking at reality when you produce flowers every single day. What I noticed there is they had different kind of pots. They had different sizes, shapes, and colors for different kind of seeds. And uh, I asked the gardener about how they decide what seed to put in what pot. And he told me, well, there are certain rules. And uh, he also shared with me, you know, sometimes you plant a seed in a small 
pot. And that's fine for a while. But with time, that plant will start outgrowing the pot. And you know what you have to do after that? Of course, ladies know, you have to move the plant from the small pot into a larger pot. As I said, words function like pots. It means that there is a container and there is content in the container. Words are container and content together. If you only look at the container, you can be easily tricked. For instance, look at this container. What does it write on it? What is that? Actual. What is actual? Well, actual is something real, right? Okay, is anybody here that can read Spanish? Okay, read it to me. What does actual mean? It's the same word on the outside. What is it? Something current, something present, something happening right now. Same container, different content. All right, look at this one. This one is a very tricky. What does it write? Gift. Gift. Would you like a gift? Okay. Well, if you were German, anybody speaks German here? German? No? If you were German, you would not like to get a gift. Because gift in German is, you know what? Poison. Uh-huh. Same container, different content. Look at this one. Huh? Kiss. Would you like a kiss? Not from me. From, uh, from your uh, husband, wife, uh, family members. Would you like a kiss? Well, if you're Hungarian, anybody speaks Hungarian here? No, if you're Hungarian, this doesn't mean kiss. This, this means something very small. That's what it means in Hungarian. And uh, look at this one. What is it? Cap. Now, uh, if you are American or English, or you speak English, then cap will be something you put on your head. But if you're Romanian, then cap is your head itself. Did you get it? Yeah? Container, same container, but totally different content in it. So as I was saying, I am looking for parts when I read. Because in those parts, I want to plant seeds. The seeds of truth, the seeds of the gospel, the seeds of the kingdom. But I always am looking for the right part. And I learned that from the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, right at the beginning in the introduction, the prologue of the gospel. You can look at that picture. You have uh, John 1, 1 to 3, and John 1, 18 on the two sides of the hill, right at the foot of the hill. Let us read together. John chapter 1. From the very first verse. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. And now jump to verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who's in the bosom of the Father, He has declared him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are here because you want to give us a message about how we should be on the lookout constantly to always find the right path 
to plant the seed of the gospel. And we pray that you will open our hearts and minds so we will be able to spot the right pot. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen. When John the Apostle, the, the gospel writer, started writing his gospel, his intention was not to give a comprehensive account of what Jesus did or said in this world. His desire was not to give us everything, all the details, all the stories, no. Actually, he recognizes in the last verse of the last chapter, which is 21 verse 25, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose, he says, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. But when he writes his gospel, he has a twofold purpose in mind. And this twofold purpose you can find in uh, the previous chapter, chapter 20, verse 31. This is what he says, chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written, I mean the things that he wrote in the gospel, these are written, why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And what, what is the other reason? That believing you may have life in his name. So, for one, I would like you to believe that Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah, is the anointed. Yes, he is the Son of God. And by believing, second, you will have life in his name. This is beautiful, but get this. John, the gospel writer, is a Jew. A Jew born and raised in the Jewish culture, somewhere in Galilee. But uh, the people to whom he writes are not Jews born and raised in a Jewish culture somewhere in Palestine. They are Gentiles or pagans from among the nations. And maybe among them there are also Jews, but not Jews that were born and raised there in Palestine. They are Jews that were born and raised somewhere in the diaspora. Just like you have today Peruvians born here in the United States, or Armenians born here in the United States, or even Romanians born, not me, my kids, born here in the United States. We call that in America second generation immigrants. Second generation immigrant is somebody that has at least one of the parents come to this country as an immigrant. Now, let me ask you, if you are born in the United States, your parents came from somewhere, is your culture the same as the culture of your parents? No. Yeah, some of those born here have a very difficult time even learning the language of their parents. And mind you, language is one of the most powerful carriers of culture. So here I am, I'm a Jew, and I write the gospel. I want to write the gospel because that's what the Spirit wants from me. I want to write the gospel about Jesus Christ, the good news about Jesus Christ, and I have to spread the seed of the gospel, but I need the right pots for that. How am I, a Jew, born in a Jewish culture, in Galilee, how am I going to present the gospel in a way that the mind of the Gentiles from the Greco-Roman world, people that don't think like me, they will get it. They will understand it. That the seeds will produce plants and they will flourish in their hearts. That's a real challenge. Because I want to give you a Messiah, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, the Christos in Greek. I want to give you somebody and something related to him that you have no idea of. How am I going to do this? Because you don't have the Old Testament. 
I do have the Old Testament. If you were Jew, born in the Jewish culture, you would know it from the Old Testament, but you don't have it. Plato and Socrates didn't write about Jesus. The Old Testament did. So how am I going to do this? Well, John really knew his Bible, meaning the Old Testament, because that's the Bible of his time. How do I know he knew his Bible? Well, John had the chance, the privilege, to study the Bible with the very author of the Bible. And that's significant. Is there anybody here that had the chance to read a book first and then meet the author of that book? Even take a class with the author of that book on the same topic, okay? How was that experience? Very interesting experience, right? It can even be life-changing. I remember I was, I was a student, and in my student years, I was very involved in music ministry. I sang uh, in uh, several quartets and singer groups. I played the trombone with some other folks. And uh, in the final year of my college, I had the chance to go and uh, do a tour in Europe. And among other places, we ended up spending some time at Bogenhofen. Bogenhofen is one of the most famous Seventh-day Adventist colleges in Europe. It's in Austria. So I'm there, and to my surprise, I meet there a childhood friend. Jolt, my childhood friend, he's there as a student. He has no idea I am going to come there to visit. I have no idea he's there as a student. So you can imagine, it was a great reunion for us. We spent some time catching up. But at the end of our time there, he wanted to give me a gift. And he knew I had a special attraction, a special, something special for the book of Revelation. And uh, he gave me the book uh, fresh out of the oven of Ranko Stefanovic, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. I was so happy about it. I was excited. I, I couldn't wait to start reading. I started reading and in a few months later, a few months later, I was hired as a pastor. I started doing Revelation seminars right away. Now, two years from there, I was given the privilege to go and study to, to get a master's degree in religion. First class, watch this, first class in that uh, master's program, because this is, what, this is not a program that you can pick and choose your classes. They have it pre-established, and you just have to go through all of the classes they pre-established for you. First class is exegesis of the book of Revelation. And who's the teacher? Ronko Stefanovic. Oh, my goodness. I had read the book. I was amazed about uh, the richness of its content. And now I have the author of the book in the classroom, and I can listen. I can ask my questions. And I had tough questions. And the guy was able to answer. He had clarity. He had conviction. I said, oh, my goodness, this is really, this guy does not only write his books, he knows his books. But watch this. John, the gospel writer, has the chance to sit with Jesus Christ in his class for three years and a half. And then he has an intensive, like a class, an intensive class of 40 days after the resurrection. You remember? When Jesus goes back to the Old Testament and takes things point by point, step by step, pointing out to them how those things are fulfilled in his own life. That's amazing. I, I, I can imagine how Jesus taught John and uh, the other companions, the other students, about the Torah. The Torah, or the Torah in Hebrew, the Torah is the instruction, the teaching, the guidance, or the law given by God. Now, in Jewish culture, the Torah is the five books of Moses right at the beginning, the first five books of the 
Bible, of the Old Testament. But it's not limited to that. Because in Jewish thinking, everything else written in the Old Testament, all the narrative of the Old Testament is by extension part of the same Torah. But there's something more about it. If you read carefully the Bible, the Old Testament, and you want to see what it says about Torah, you will see that in some places, Torah comes across to you like a person. Read, for instance, Psalm 119. You read the psalm, and it, it seems like the writer of that psalm is in love with Torah. That's remarkable. And then there is another concept. It's called chokmah. Chokmah is wisdom, is divine wisdom. And yes, if you read the, the Old Testament about chokmah, you will easily get to the conclusion that chokmah is something that happens within God's mind. But then when you read carefully, especially, for instance, Proverbs chapter 1. In Proverbs chapter 1, wisdom comes to you as if it was a person. It's like a lady walking the streets of the city, a lady that stops at the crossroads, a lady that stops at the marketplace, a lady that stops at uh, the entrance of the city, at the gates. And she cries out, and she invites everybody to come and listen to her words of wisdom. Huh. And if you go just a few chapters further in Proverbs chapter 8, you will find the same wisdom as being a master craftsman that was there with God, side by side with God, and was the agent of creation. But isn't Jesus the one that walked the streets of Jerusalem, stopping here and there, crying out? Isn't He the Creator? Isn't He the one that brings all these features of wisdom together, and Paul calls Him, He's the wisdom of God? Then another concept. It's called Davar. Davar. Davar in the Old Testament is many times translated, translated as word. But Davar is not only word. Davar is also deed. Davar is not only something that is being said. Davar is also something that is being done. Now, the prophets say, the word of God came to me. Okay, how did the word of God come to you? Is the word of God somebody that can come to you? Well, not exactly. But then take the other passage, like Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, where God says, I send out my word, and my word will not come back to me void or empty. What is this about? Don't you feel like this is something more than just a word? It sounds like a person. And then, if you look at Jesus Christ, didn't Jesus Christ masterfully combine what we call word and work? Didn't He combine the announcement and the action of the, of the kingdom? Didn't He beautifully bring together the proclamation of the kingdom and the performance of the kingdom? So, watch this. John, the gospel writer, sits in Jesus' class, especially in the final intensives. And at the end of this class, he says, it, it, it kind of dawns on him, oh my goodness, this guy, our master, Jesus, the one that we call the Christ, the Messiah, he's, he's not just somebody that knows the Old Testament. He's not only the author of the Old Testament. He is 
the Old Testament. He is the book. Eureka! How am I going to give this seed of the gospel to a pagan? Because if they thought the way I think, if they had the same pots, I would spot those pots right away. But looking in their culture, I can't see those pots. So I need a pot of their own. And, and I'm going to, to go prayerfully looking around, see if I can find a pot. Now, somebody may think, uh, think Pastor, stop it, stop it. Didn't the Holy Spirit tell John, the gospel writer, what to write? Uh, yes and no. Because, and, and I'm quoting this, Ellen White says that those writers, okay, God is the author, Jesus is the author. Those writers function not as pans, but as pen men. And then she goes on in Selected Messages, the first volume, uh, chapter of verse, uh, page 21, it says, it is not the words of the Bible that are inspired. Not the words, not the parts are inspired, but the men that were inspired. Okay? So not the parts, the one that tries spotting the parts. He's inspired or she's inspired. Inspiration acts not on the man's words or his expressions, but on the man himself who under the influence of the Holy Ghost is what? Imbued with words, pots? No, 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 thoughts. Is it the container or rather the content? It's the content. It's not the container. But the words receive the impress of the individual mind. The divine mind is diffused. The divine mind and will is combined with the human mind and will, thus the utterance of the man, well, actually, this is how I should read it, thus the utterance of the man are the words of whom? Of God. So did you get the difference between the container and the content? So here is John looking for a container to pour into that container to, to plant the wonderful seeds of the gospel, what he got from the class of the author himself about the Messiah. And he walks around, and he looks and looks, and he can't find too many pots that would be the right pot. But then he spots the right pot. It's such an amazing experience when you finally can spot the right pot. And he finds this pot. The pot is logos. Logos, or logos in Greek. Huh. That is very similar because this, this container, this pot here, contains the expression of the impersonal mind of the divine. The impersonal mind of the divine. Well, it's not the exact same thing that I know about Hokma, but Hokma has something similar because it is wisdom that enlightens human persons. Oh, okay, something similar. Then there is another element, another seed in this pot. What is this? Well, cosmic principle or some sort of a substance that comes from the cosmos and creates the ordered word, world. Oh, okay. Huh. Yeah, this sounds similar to what I know about Torah, principle, creative principle. But that's not only a principle because the Messiah, the real Torah, is not a power or principle only. He's a person. And that's what I have here in uh, the pot called Torah, a cosmic, creative, and ordering person. Very interesting. What else do we have here? Hmm. 
communication from the realm of the divine. Uh, okay, okay, but isn't that exactly, well, not exactly, almost what Davar is doing? Davar, the, the word and the action of God? Yes, but if I look at the pot called Davar, it says God communicating God. That's different. So how can I use then their parts? I'm talking about evangelism, if you didn't get it, okay? How can I use their part and still convey the message from your parts? Well, there's a way to do it. You try to empty this pot and you pour in this pot the content, the content of your Parts. Does that make sense? All right. So now, with this in mind, try and get why John the Apostle, the Gospel writer, starts his Gospel the way he starts it. Right at the beginning, to create a bridge over the gap and to break the cultural concrete between him, the Jew, and the Gentiles, that are not from the Jewish culture. This is what he says. In the beginning, oh, it's, it's, it starts like the Old Testament. Have you noticed that? In the beginning, how, how does it say in Genesis? In the beginning, God, right? So in the be beginning was what? The Logos. And the Logos, oh, that's, that's, that's this part. But watch and see how John puts a totally different content in the container. He says, yes, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. Uh-oh, so this is a different kind of Logos. Yeah, we, we, we know this container, but, but there's something more now, more content in it. He, the Logos, was in the beginning with God. Huh. Interesting. All things were made through him, through the Logos. And without him, nothing was made that was made. And then jump to verse 18. And see how it all makes sense when it says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father, who's that? The Logos. He had declared, or exegeomai. Exegeomai is the word from which exegesis comes, for those that know the technical term. Okay? So the Logos is the one that explains, brings out God to the Greek, to the Roman, to everybody. This kind of mission focus, this kind of evangelistic strategy is was what was called by Don Richardson, redemptive analogy. Don Richardson was a missionary that used to work among the Sawi tribes in Indonesia. And he said, this is what redemptive analogy is. When you go and look out and try to spot the right pot, because in those cultures, there might be something, a word, an object, a practice, something that God has been already creating there in that culture, so that when you come, as a missionary, you can take that pot, empty it from its original content, and pour the content of the gospel in those pots. And you may think, wow, that's pretty strange. But just think about it. Didn't Jesus Christ use the same strategy? When he said, and the kingdom of God is like a dragnet, was he talking about the dragnet? 
Or when he was looking at the people that were fishing, he spotted a pot on the spot. And he said, oh my goodness, that's a good pot for me. Let me put some kingdom into that pot. And he created a parable. Or when Jesus said, I am the door. Was Jesus saying he was the door? Is Jesus a door? No. Jesus used the door as a pot. He put himself in the door. I was thinking, what kind of redemptive analogies can we use now here in Laguna Niguel on the west coast, close to the, the ocean, in a culture of surfers? Well, Jesus is the surfboard. Huh? And pour some gospel. Yeah, make friends that can surf if you can surf. Don't try to use the surfboard as a submarine. Jesus can be the submarine too, but Jesus is not the surfboard and the submarine at the same time. Because then you, you can die easily. So, do you understand how this concept works? You know, we, we complain that Christianity is shrinking in America. And that's true. But have we been intentional about spotting the pots to plant the seeds of the gospel, the seeds of truth? It takes intentionality. I told you when I read, I look for seeds and I look for pots. When I watch a video, a TED talk, or I listen to an audio book, or I speak with a human being because a human being is a book too. Be looking for pots. I spotted a pot right this morning. I came out of the house and my neighbor was watering the flowers and we had just a few words. It was the first time I, I got to see him and know him. Well, we met before at the mailbox and, and, and I said, man, that's, that's a pot right there. Jesus is the water. I'm not at that level yet with him. But at least I spotted what? A pot. For quite some time, sociologists were speaking about the American society being a melting pot. In which you are thrown in like the ingredients of a stew. And they stir you and they stir you and they stir you. And you become a homogenous spread by the end of the day. If that were the right picture, it wouldn't be that difficult. Because then you should just know the culture of the, of the spot, of, of, the, of the melting pot, and you learn the pot, and you pour your content there. But that's not what America is. That's not what this region is. This region, and now sociologists, use this term more than the melting pot, is a salad bowl. Salad bowl. Like a tossed salad in which you throw tomatoes and cucumbers and red pepper. And the interesting thing is that the tomatoes taste tomato, the cucumbers taste cucumber, the red pepper taste red pepper. And they are tossed against one another. They collide and uh, they, they hit one another, but they don't care. A tomato doesn't know what a cucumber is. A cucumber doesn't know what a tomato is. I'm talking about the American society. That's where we are at. And things are even more complicated for the younger generation. Because for a while, we thought America was a Christian society nominally. But right now, the younger generation lives in a post-Christian world, post-Christian era, which means that many of them have no Christian roots at all. Or some of them have some Christian roots, and they, they express it like this. You know, my, my mom and dad uh, would go to church uh, 
at least they would go sometimes, but I'm not really into these kind of things. So now, you are supposed to do evangelism, to bring the seeds of the gospel and plant them. Where? You need the pot. You need to be on the lookout to spot the pot. Are you doing it intentionally with your own kids? And then with other kids, the younger generation. I, I read something this week and I was shaken and shocked. It's from Adventist Home. This is what it says. Parents make a most terrible mistake when they neglect the work of giving their children religious training. Thinking that they will come out all right in the future and as they get older will of themselves be anxious for a religious experience. And then she asks, cannot you see, parents, that if you do not plant the precious seeds of truth, of love, and heavenly attributes in the heart, Satan will sow the field of the heart with tears? Isn't that sobering, to say the least? And it shook me. And I was thinking about my own children. It's amazing how children in this age are pretty much the same everywhere in the world. You know why? Because they grow up with the same heroes with the same stories because of media and social media. Are we intentional about finding their parts so we can plant the seeds of the gospel, of the Messiah? We spent two months in Romania before we came here to our family, to our new family. Two months, two months, that's a long time, too long. <laughs> and uh, we came back. But I remember one day we were walking in a beautiful park in one of the large cities. And uh, my kids, probably Alessandra, immediately spotted somebody wa that was doing face painting and uh, of course when a girl sees face painting she immediately wants to be converted into a butterfly and that's what she wanted she wanted a butterfly painted on her face yeah but uh, I have not only a six-year-old daughter I have a three-year-old son as well and when, she, when he saw his, do, his uh, sister, what did he want? Face painting. Okay, but Brian, what do you want? Which one? Superhero. <laughs> superhero? I thought, where does this guy know superhero from? Okay, he got a superhero face painting. That's amazing, you know, how... These kids didn't want to wash for like uh, a week. They didn't want to wash their face. It was already uh, dripping and dropping. <laughs> but no, no, no. They, they wanted to keep the butterfly, a superhero. Now, a few days later, I'm walking with my son, only me and him. And uh, out of a sudden, he tells me, Daddy, I'm superhero. And I look at him and I ask, you are? And he says, no, superhero doesn't exist. That's how he, he cannot say exist. Superhero doesn't exist. And I said, I told myself, man, that's an excellent pot there. And I told him, Brian, superhero does exist. Jesus is superhero. 
he stopped like, oh, he is? Now, I think you all can realize what a small pot that is. And how you will have to take the plant and move it in a larger pot. But you have to start somewhere. And you have to be intentional. I was in Cameroon some uh, huh, more than 15 years ago. First time outside of my country to do mission. And I preach about baptism. I had it nailed. Then at the end of uh, my sermon, my translator turns at me, turns to me, and tells me, I think you could have used the illustration with the cassava, the yucca. What is that? With the, you know, manioc? What is that? And then he told me, oh, there's a root that's very hard, but then you have to put it into water to soak, and then it gets soft, and then they wrap it up in banana leaves, and then they eat it like bread. I said, oh, okay, I could have used that. And why didn't I use it? Because I didn't know there was a pot there. I should have been much more intentional about looking out for pots. Look out to spot the right pot. If you go to the Bible, read through the Gospel of John, and read the other three Gospels as well, you will see that John is totally different. The language of John's Gospel is different. Structure is different. Almost everything is different. The Gospel is the same. Why? Because the synoptics wrote to one audience. John wrote his gospel to a different audience. Yes, the gospel stays the same. But you have to see the pots of your neighbor. You have to be looking to spot the pots of your relatives. You have to be looking to spot the pots of your work colleagues so you can plant the seeds of the gospel there. Don't worry, the Holy Spirit will give rain, even in the desert. And one day, you never know when, you will just start seeing the plant coming out of the pot. This is my message. This is what I want to leave you with. Be on the lookout 24-7. And always try to spot the right pot. Amen. Amen. Now is the time to collect tithes and offerings. If the deacons could come forward. And as the praise team sings, if you could stay seated to pass the plate, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. What a beautiful sermon we have. As our hearts and minds have been open to possibilities and to our duty and inspired as well to the things that God can bring in our lives if we are intentional and we watch out and think of how we can impart the message in some meaningful way to our loved ones and those that we meet. We chose a song that would go along with the sermon that's in, uh, inviting the Lord to take our lives and to make what he would like out of them. So sing with us while remaining seated. 
Take my life and let it be. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for pouring the seed of the gospel into human vessels, fragile pots where the seeds can germinate, start growing, become fruitful and bring fruit to your kingdom. Lord, we have seen John, the gospel writer, how he used the pots of his audience. Lord, open our eyes. Give us intentionality so that we will Spot the pots, will plant the seeds so that people around us will be brought into the kingdom, will recognize Jesus Christ as being the Messiah, your Son, and at the same time, by believing, they will have life in your name. May your Spirit continue the meditation of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>